Hello, hello, hello. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from uh, from uh, whichever part of the world that you're connecting from. I'm just looking at the people who are connected here, and then we get going. All right. Um, yes, uh, can you hear me? I think Eric has uh, mentioned that. So, all right. So welcome to this uh, webinar on supply chain mapping okay i'll be your facilitator for this webinar uh, we'll also have uh, the chat where you can ask your questions write your comments we'll go to a q a session later on as well uh, and i have eric in uh, the background uh, who is not seen who's not heard but he's moderating this uh, this particular webinar and you can write everything in the chat and he will then put this uh, uh, put this in the in in the chat for me to see. All right, excellent. Uh, I can see uh, a few people again connecting from different parts of the world. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're just looking. I can see some familiar names also. Francois. All right, very good. Hi, Francois. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Jill uh, Zephoni. Hi. Uh, very good. Uh, good to see you. Uh, after a long time, I hope we remember a few a few things from our supply chain uh, interactions earlier, <laughs> class interactions earlier. Very good. Mirko is here. Hello, Mirko. Very good. Good to see you. Good to see some familiar names. All right. Excellent. So what uh, we are going to do is uh, a quick look on the agenda. OK, this will be around 40 minutes, I would say. OK, around roughly 40 minutes. We'll go through this uh, this agenda. And in the end, we will also keep some time for uh, Q&A. OK, right. So uh, we're going to jump straight into the topic on what is supply chain mapping okay for which i'll just start off with a small example okay so i have this phone with me right so i was looking at the phone the other day and saying okay so if i look at my phone there are like i don't know 500 baud parts and more than more than uh, hundreds of parts that get inside this phone right now i want to understand where do all these parts come from if especially if i'm a phone manufacturer i want to know where are all these parts coming from right uh, so i was looking at i was trying to investigate uh, and then i came across this particular uh, informative site okay on the fairphone and the name suggests fairphone so they are declaring a lot of their uh, uh, information as well uh, for transparency so if you look at the map here that you can see on the screen which is done by source map uh, it gives you a lot of information on where these different parts and raw materials are coming from. Okay, for example, on in this phone there is this screen, uh, right? There's a screen, then there is the there's a microphone, a loudspeaker inside. There are batteries. There are some printed circuit boards. There's a SIM card holder, and then there is the casing itself. There's a lot of stuff that goes inside this phone. And as a manufacturer, I want to understand where each of this stuff comes from, right? And that is the basis of uh, what we call supply chain mapping. When you answer these questions, where are these different parts coming from, which are the suppliers, et cetera, et cetera, and you reach till the level of raw materials that answers the question, and it results in a, what we call supply chain mapping. Okay, so that's a very simple definition. If you just look at the pure, purely the definition of that, so it's a process of gathering, storing, and tracing information, right? Tracing information in the entire supply chain, okay, from raw material to the final market and beyond. So if I'm a phone manufacturer, I'm not only looking at where are all these different parts coming from, I trace that, but also to the final market. Okay, which are my distributors, which are the retailers and the end consumers, because there is a lot of reverse logistics also happening today, right? So it's not only till the time I make this, but also I'm going to track reverse logistics, so market, final market and beyond. So that's the idea. Okay, that's the essence of what we call supply chain mapping. Okay, so tracing your products or services to the entire supply chain from the origin to the final market and beyond okay that's a simple definition of supply chain mapping let's get a bit deeper into this topic now right so why is it uh, critical and what are the benefits why do i have to do this okay what are the benefits of this so we see uh, today and 
uh, or the last few years also, there are a lot of issues that are happening around us, right? We went through the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there was the Brexit. There's a financial crisis that we uh, that we went across. There's the uh, you know geographical and geopolitical conflicts that we have seen. Uh, there are some government changes with resulting changes in policies and so on and so forth. So a lot of things happening. And one of the focus areas of companies is resilience and security of supply. These are some of the top agendas in companies, right? Given all these conflicts, given all these issues that are around, companies want to ensure security of supply with good risk resilience. Right? So that's the first part that we keep aside for now. Okay. The second part on the right, as you can see, there are a lot of stringent regulatory and reporting requirements today, right? Across different levels. So there is reporting requirements on sustainability or you could say purely transparency and so on and so forth, compliance and so on. Right. So if we just go back to the example of the firm, and for some reason, you realize that there is some chemical component used in the phone that is not compliant and you get uh, a notice from a regulatory authority. I would want to know immediately where is this component originating, right? Where is this chemical originating from? And so I will go back and I trace because I have a nice little map and trace now of who are all these suppliers and from where, which areas, et cetera, et cetera. So I can go back and quickly identify this issue and get to a resolution, right? So there are a lot of compliance benefits that you can have. Uh, the other thing is the consumer has become more and more conscious. The consumer also wants to know where he or she is buying the product and all uh, from and all the elements that get inside this product. Uh, they're also conscious about whether the company is sourcing from a conflict mineral zone, let's say, or uh, is there modern slavery involved? Uh, is this sustainable? Uh, which areas is this uh, product coming from. So if I look at, if I go back and see if I want to look at the Fairphone again, and I'm going to say, oh, these plastics are coming from India here. There's a tungsten ore, which is coming from Rwanda. Uh, there's this gold ore, which is coming from Peru. Uh, are there are there any issues around these areas and so on and so forth? So the consumer has become very, very conscious. And there's a lot of information floating around, right? People see documentaries on YouTube, on Netflix, and so on and so forth. There's plenty of this information overload that the consumer is, is used to now, and he's become more conscious. Okay, so the companies are also undergoing, you can say, more and more internal as well as external scrutiny. Okay, so on the one side, we talked about security of supply because of a lot of issues. And the other side, the consumer is conscious, uh, there are regulatory requirements, and so the companies are undergoing more and more internal and external scrutiny, right? So this sets the context to why supply chain mapping becomes critical. And then there are benefits that come along with it, right? So let's look at some of the benefits as a part of the business case as to why we want to embark on uh, supply chain mapping. So once you have the mapping, you can see, uh, we can see the critical raw materials. You can see the flow of the critical raw materials. Uh, and that's where we can talk about risk minimization. So as I said, resilience, risk resilience and security of supply. Once we have all the mapping, we can identify the issues at the right moment and then fix these. So we can minimize our risk. There could be plenty of opportunities for cost savings. Is the supply chain lean enough? Are there some non-value added tasks, non-value added nodes and links that are added in the supply chain? This could also be um, uh, dealt with detail once we have the mapping. Uh, we talked about uh, compliance and the conscious consumer. So there's a lot of impact on the brand and reputation, right? So we have seen plenty of cases like this before where uh, uh, let's say uh, there is a chocolate maker and the consumer has read somewhere and there's a report that comes out saying that, hey, this chocolate maker is using cocoa from some of the cooperatives in Ivory Coast where there is some element of modern slavery. And then we say, wow, that's a big impact on the brand and reputation of the company, right? Even though the supplier that we're talking about may be tier three, tier four, tier five, tier six in the organization chart. 
But once we know where our mapping is from, it, then we can protect our brand and reputation in a much stronger manner. Okay, uh, supply chain performance management also. So again, as I said, typically linked to the cost savings, we can improve and optimize the supply chain performance itself, looking at different logistics, uh, some of the process optimizations and so on. Uh, the other advantages we see, which is on the right, is purely working closer with our supplier in integrated operations. Yeah, so you could have operations which could be integrated very well with our suppliers you could have access to a lot of innovation not only from your tier one but beyond tier one you could go to tier two tier three tier four because you know who are the people involved and which geographical areas there is they are coming from right so we're talking about innovation uh, which is not only from tier one but beyond that and then we also talk about sustainability right that's a fairly significant topic in, uh, today so uh, we talk about sustainability, we can track again uh, beyond tier one and tier two and see the sustainability uh, footprint, let's say, of all our uh, sub-tier suppliers. Cybersecurity is also a big issue. So a lot of the times we have seen cases where there are some cyber attacks on organizations through the suppliers. Okay, so they identify the hackers or whoever these uh, these organizations and people are, they identify um, the weak link in the supply chain and then would probably want to enter the organization through these weak links. So once we have the mapping, we can strengthen our cyber security as well. And then, of course, that there is again uh, following about the digital transformation of the entire supply chain itself, where you can work together with the integrated operations to set up these digitalization solutions. Okay, so you can see there are plenty of advantages and benefits of supply chain mapping that can give you a strong business case to go ahead and implement this in your organization. Okay, so um, let's look at some of the key elements now. So we know now know what is supply chain mapping and why is it critical and some of the benefits that can give you a very solid business case. Let's look at the key elements. Uh, before I get into some of the key elements, I just uh, came across this very, very informative and very nice, simple chart, which differentiates supply chain maps with the other global value chain and supply network maps and so on, with the other different types of maps that we have. So, so I thought it's an important point to differentiate this. Uh, the one that is marked here, as you can see, here is the supply chain maps okay however there are other types of maps uh, i think earlier i had done a webinar on value stream mapping uh, a few months ago i had done a webinar on value stream mapping where we focused a little bit more on value added activities how do i optimize uh, material for flow and information flow and so on and so forth right so there are different things so if you look at this this global picture when we talk at the macro level so we are talking at the level of countries and industries. Yeah? No, so there we have what we call the global value chain maps. Okay, there we have the global value chain maps where we talk about, let's say if I have to find out information about at the country level, what are the imports, exports that get out of the country, uh, overall focus on the large economy. Okay, so we understand a little bit of the global value chain maps there. One level below, then we talk about supply network maps. So it's not only a, a mapping of purely a product like the phone, for example, but we talk about inter-firm or inter-industry networks. If I am buying aluminium, there will be plenty of other industries that also buy aluminium. So we talk about the supply network maps there. I'll share with you a, an example later on, which is on the border of this. And then we talk about supply chain maps. This is what we will do uh, purely on an inter and inter firm facility. The focus is largely on the product, right? We talk about the iPhone, for example, the, the Fairphone, for example. The focus is largely on the product and all the components uh, and activities that get inside this product. Uh, then value stream mapping is largely on the material, again, optimization of that. And then uh, there's another at the very mi micro level on process maps. So how to improve process maps and just going on the different steps in the process. So it's important to know where supply chain mapping fits in, where we largely focus on the product and we are not talking about economy or inter-industry or firm focus. We're just largely talking about the product itself. 
Okay, so that's where we come from. Now, if we go, just go and look at the key elements, what are the key elements? The first thing I would like to uh, like to do, if I have to go and embark on a, a journey of mapping my supply chain, I first want to understand what is the purpose. Why do I want to do this? And the purpose is is very is very very important. If I want to look at risk and stability of the supply chain, there will be some other elements that I will look at. If I just want to purely focus on cost saving opportunities, right, then there will be some other elements that will be included in that. Uh, if I just want to redesign the supply chain and eliminate certain nodes and links within the supply chain there's going to be a, another focus, right? Some other elements might be involved. So the first thing is to identify what is the purpose. Purpose is the key, okay? Then the generic elements that we see here are first, of course, we talk about suppliers, we talk about customers, all the materials that get inside this particular product, who are the people involved, the technologies involved, and the processes that are involved, okay? Largely these six key elements, which are, as I said, very generic. And then depending on the purpose and the key focus, there could be some small changes or you get deeper into some areas versus uh, you know, just being superficial in some other areas, depending on the purpose. So suppliers, customers, materials, processes, people, and technology. These are six key elements that get into the mapping. OK, uh, if you look at uh, largely supply chain maps, they are, again, largely used for strategic purposes um, for due to uh, you know, the, the purposes that we see here. They can also be used for operational tactical, but then we get slightly at the ma micro level where we talk about value stream mapping or process mapping, which is one level below. So this is more for operational tactical, but a, a basic basic umbrella can be created with the supply chain maps and then you can go deeper inside okay you could do supply chain mapping also for industry sometimes so beyond product we start looking at one level above as well so uh, i'll give you an example later on so if we just focus on the product you could also have a mapping just to extend it a little bit and talk about industry or you can go further very very deep into specific generated commodities like cocoa beans or fruits and vegetables and so on and so forth okay so there are these subtle differences the way in which you want to expand the supply chain map either on the top at a more macro level that's what we have seen more macro level where you can go towards industries or a more micro level where you start looking at all the details of value streams and process maps uh, if you want to stay purely on the product, then this is where we have the pure supply chain. Okay, so that's the just to give you a variation in in the differences. Right. So some of the uh, the basic ones that we just talked about are the nodes. We need to identify the nodes who participates in the supply chain. So these are there are two types of participants. One is the primary participant, where this primary participant is contributing directly to the value added activities. OK, and then there is a secondary participant, which is typically including third party logistics providers who have their own value add, of course, but they are not directly participating in the value add activities. They are indirectly participating. For example, you have customs agencies, third party logistics, some regulators, uh, finance and insurance companies, uh, auditors and so on and so forth. OK, so these are different primary participants as nodes and then secondary participants as well. One is direct value add, another one is indirect value add, okay? And then the second part of the mapping is the links. How the participants that we just talked about are connected? How are these connected? So you could have uh, uh, material flow, information flow, and financial flow. These are primarily the, uh, the flows that we talk about. So material, physical flow, right uh, if you are looking at the product the physical flow of the product this part is coming from this geography by this supplier to another place and then it moves to for some processing and then moves to another place and so on so this is the material flow then there's the informational flow right uh, informational flow from uh, your organization maybe you send across certain forecasts to your supplier and the supplier sends you some capacity information and so on so there are some informational flow and then finally the financial flows right uh, again from both directions because of 
uh, as I said, a lot of reverse logistics and so on. So you you could have a flow where you're basically paying your supplier and the supplier pays your supplier and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, you could have other direction as well with returns and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are what we call the links where we have material, information, and financial flow across these participants, which is primary and secondary, who, who form the nodes. Okay, so nodes and links are the two critical elements where which can help you to map your supply chain. The other supporting elements, okay, that we are talking about are just to identify. Uh, uh, the geographical locations of these different participants. Uh, what physical assets do they have? How many factories, buildings, and so on and so forth? This can also be included later on. Uh, what are their capabilities? Okay. What are the tools and resources? Uh, what technology did they use? And what are the patents or intellectual property rights that them, they might have? And some newer elements today that we see, we talk about footprint. Yeah, this is another topic completely, but uh, then we can go deeper into understanding the carbon footprint of each of your suppliers, which is falling in your scope three calculations that talk about circular economy and so on and so forth. So there are some other elements which can be extended, but these are uh, some supporting elements you can add on to make the supply chain mapping a bit more comprehensive. Okay, so for example, if I go back very quickly to the fair phone, okay, uh, example, and if you if you go to this, the site, you can just Google and, and, and go there and fair phone supply chain. And if you just hover your uh, mouse over these specific areas, so if I click on gold or here, it tells you where the gold ore is coming from, which is a supplier in Peru and so on and so forth. This is tungsten ore. If I click here, it gives you some information about the supplier. Then you go deeper into the supply to understand capacities and technology and so on and so forth. So this can go, you can go deeper and deeper. Uh, so th this kind of tools help you uh, understand that. Okay, but this is again the supporting information that goes along with all the other elements that you have mapped on. Okay, right. Um, then we move on. Uh, to where do I find all these information, right? Uh, so there is sources of uh, information. So of course you have primary and secondary sources. The primary sources is largely what you have internal. So you have your ERP systems already. You can gather a lot of information from there. Uh, you can have interviews with your suppliers, right? Uh, have audits, uh, you can have surveys sent across and so on and so forth. Uh, you could also, from your experience or direct observation, uh, uh, get this information. And largely, this is all the data that you have internally. The secondary data uh, that you have is you can have this information collected from higher levels of hierarchy. Let's say you have national and international organizations who gather this data and can sell these data, right? So that's the secondary data that you could have. So the first is what you have as a part of your uh, network and connection itself. So you go to your supplier, tier one, get information from tier one, then go to tier two and tier three and so on and so forth. There's a lot of work involved here, as you can see very clearly, but this is the primary data source. The other is secondary data source where you can simply buy certain information, which is already done by specialized companies. Okay. The other thing which is a bit difficult to get is to understand uh, data like the buyer supplier relationship. Right. Um, uh, when I say relationships, how closely they work, uh, what is the innovation they might be sharing, and so on and so forth. That's a bit challenging uh, to get beyond your tier two or tier three. Right. But nonetheless, you can try and try and get this information as as much as possible. So I just try to equate this. Uh, I've just written down here below. So as a lot of you are from procurement and supply chain, you are probably fairly familiar with uh, the Porter's Five Forces analysis. And uh, if I have to analyze a particular product, a particular market, uh, I use uh, Porter's five, five Forces. And it's like analyzing a series of Porter's Forces along the supplier and customer line. Okay, so if I have, if I'm in the center here, I'm going to look at my suppliers. These suppliers are customers to some other suppliers. These for, further on, these suppliers are customers to some other suppliers. So I go deeper and deeper and try and analyze at each level. And beyond that, my customers are suppliers to some other customers 
who are again suppliers to some other customers. So I go on the other side of the spectrum as well. Okay, so this is where I can get, it's a simple analogy. How can we understand supply chain mapping if I look at borders by forces to understand the market, right? So that's how, how, we can, how I can uh, get this information, right? And these are all the, through the primary and secondary sources that we talked about, okay? Right, uh, moving on, uh, we'll just look at a couple of examples where I saw a question here, will files record be shared? Yes, they will be, by the way, Lauren, okay, to answer your question. So they will be uh, shared. All right, uh, looking at uh, examples of supply chain maps. So I have just given, uh, written down two examples to show you how it looks like. The first one is a supply chain map of a garment maker. Okay, so let's say you are a garment maker. Okay, this is your company. Uh, uh, buy the garment. I transform it into certain products. Let's say I'm making baby clothes. Just to give you an example, uh, I transform it uh, the garment into the baby clothes, and then I send it to my distributor, and so on and so forth. So, in the supply chain map, I would simply try and understand what is involved before I get that garment in my hand. Okay, so if I just go back right till the raw materials, okay, right till the raw materials. Let's say I'm buying some garment made out of cotton or it's a mix of cotton and polyester or cotton and silk and blah, et cetera, et cetera, okay? I would want to try and understand, okay, this raw material. So how do I reach there? I would first try and understand my tier one suppliers. This tier one suppliers could be other distributors, it could be some agents, it could be suppliers or manufacturers themselves, okay, who do certain kind of processing. So let's say there's dyeing, coating, some other processing involved, okay? And these are your direct tier one suppliers. So I go to them, I try and understand who are all these suppliers and map on all their information here. Okay, then um, I go beyond that to a fabric maker, the actual uh, supplier who is making the fabric from the raw material. So this could be some supplier one, two, three, etc. And then there could be some specifics of supplier one. Where are they making it from? What is their geographical location? Are there some intellectual property involved is that as i said all the supporting elements that go along with it the capacities and so on and so forth and where do these fabric makers source their fabric from so i go be another level beyond so this could be raw material suppliers right it could be cotton suppliers in fact you could go beyond that maybe there are some cooperatives till you go to the farmer where you can actually see the cotton plantations okay so you know exactly how your clothes that you make here in your company where are they sourced from at each level okay with all the information supporting information that comes along with it okay so this we have moved towards the left here if you start moving towards the right so where who are my distributors once i finish this, making these baby clothes i give these to my distributors okay these distributors further will send them across to the retailers Right. So who are all these retailers? Uh, what are their capacities? Again, value add at each level. And then beyond that, there's a consumer. You could have different consumer segments even. Right. So if there's uh, any issue at any point in the supply chain, I know exactly where this issue might arise if I have a full picture of the map. OK, so this is just one simple example. If I'm a garment maker where I go back, to raw materials, so the origin, as I said, to the origin, from the origin to the end market or end consumer and beyond. Maybe there are returns or some issues. You could have a circular economy involved at each of these different phases and so on and so forth. So that's that's ad ad other additional information that you can put in. But as we define supply chain map to trace and track and store information from the origin, so from the raw material here till the market and consumer and beyond if you want to track uh, with some with some uh, with some uh, as i said uh, uh, you know returns and so on and so forth so it talks about after sales and so on okay so that's that's one example of uh, the supply chain map of a garment maker there's another one which falls a little bit above so it's sitting between supply chain mapping 
and supply network mapping. So this is done actually by one of my colleagues. Uh, he, I didn't study this myself. It was one of my colleagues. I exchanged with him to understand this. Uh, this is purely for uh, extended supply chain. That's why I wrote it as extended supply chain map of a car maker. So you have a car maker here, a car manufacturer. Simple. We just want to put it this way. The car maker also wants to know there are thousands of parts that get into a car. So who are the component makers? Right. So these are the traditional ICE components. And on the right hand side, you can see the EV components. So you have uh, EV component provider, batteries, motors and so on and so forth. OK, uh, if I want to go beyond where these components come from, I talk about raw material production. So here you have steel, aluminium, et cetera, et cetera, and all the other components that get along. Beyond that, you have a for especially for EVs, you have lithium, cobalt, nickel and other rare earth elements that you go on and you can go beyond one level further to understand where the mines are the source so effectively you're mapping your supply chain i just put these arrows here on the left that you can go beyond that as i said in the porter's forces who are all the people who are where you know you have the lithium mines for example where they where are they from or the cobalt mines where are they, where are they coming from uh then where this cobalt sent for processing yeah they could you could have another a few suppliers there after the processing then they probably come to the raw material providers, right? So you can go beyond both sides. You can go beyond and try and extend this mapping. So that's why it's an extended supply chain map, which goes a little bit into the supply network mapping, one level above at the macro level. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, the car manufacturer is going to sell these cars who are the vehicle users. Uh, if this were vehicle user is an EV uh, user, so you talk about charging infrastructure. Within this charging infrastructure, what do you need? You have the charger manufacturer, electricity providers, construction um, companies and installers and so on and so forth that you can understand each of these different suppliers further. And if it's an ICE uh, classical, then you could have after sales service. So all these are, of course, involved in, in both areas. But then you have the traditional one versus the, uh, the EV ones. OK, but uh, this is, as I said, it's an extended supply chain map. This one is purely based on a particular uh, area of like baby clothes, for example, very, very specific to garment. And you can stick to this or you can go beyond and try and understand at for, for each of these different, um, uh, let's say, primary participant. What are the other primary participants beyond in the supply chain? So you go a little bit above at the macro level. OK, so just this is just a couple of examples to tell you how the mapping can be done. This is at a very, very basic level. Of course, you can go beyond and try and understand. So once you know this, you know exactly where the product is coming from origin to the end market uh, with details of each and every um, value add or de details of each and every node and link that we talked about. OK. Good. So if I want to start off, how do I go about it? If I, let's say tomorrow, I want to start off in my organization for my particular product or commodity that I buy, I want to do a supply chain map. Okay. So of course, I, I, there are plenty of uh, tools available. The one that we saw from Fairphone, this is coming from Source Map. So there are companies who are specializing in this. I'm not, I, I'm not going to tell you all the names here because I'm not endorsing anyone, but uh, there are plenty of tools available out there uh to do this but the first thing what you would not need to do internally is the following first let's say for example uh, the process huh, of supply chain mapping itself i want to understand and focus and identify which product or material or supplier group that i want to target okay once i do that i go to the level one mapping you know, how do i do that i talk as i said uh, primary data collection so through my ERP systems, I interview my suppliers, uh, subcontractors, agents, all the first year suppliers. That's where I get my level one mapping. OK, if my product consists of 10 parts, I should be having information about these 10 suppliers. Let's say I source it from 10 different suppliers or five different aggregators and three suppliers and etc. I need to map on these. Then I go beyond. Right. I try and investigate and gather information of where these tier one suppliers are buying these products from, which go in on to make these subcomponents that you buy. Right. So this, this is going beyond your tier one to tier two, tier three. And then I ma map on the lower tier suppliers. 
and then I go, I repeat that cycle. I investigate, gather information, and go beyond till you reach the raw material suppliers. Okay, till you reach the raw material suppliers. So, so, so that is a very simple process. First, I need to identify, right, and then go beyond that. In terms of organizations, if I have to develop the business case and convince my internal stakeholders that I need to put in some effort uh, to to do the supply chain mapping. Uh, the purpose, as I said, is key if I want to do the supply chain mapping for risk resilience, right? So the purpose is risk or right to focus on capacities maybe a bit more uh, and not so much on innovation technologies that the suppliers might be working on. If my focus is on cost savings, then I would probably focus on which are some additional nodes or links that probably are not adding the, the most value. So I might want to cut and eliminate those. Right. So the purpose and expectation becomes key. Uh, I also want to put a goal against in front of me. So I know what is the medium term and long term goal when I map on this, what I want to achieve. Right. What I want to achieve. So I, if the, it's it's cost savings, I want to achieve after three years, I want to cut these, 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 these nodes. If it's risk resilience after one year, I want to make sure that everything is so you have some medium term and, and long term goals. The other thing is uh, you could do is, as I said, it's the, the there are benefits, but there are also costs. There's a lot of time and effort and money that goes inside this, right? So you might, might also want to do a cost benefit analysis once you identify the purpose and the goals to say, is it worth doing the mapping exercise, right? If I'm buying certain commodities, which are very simple, low value, et cetera, et cetera, I probably would not embark on supply chain mapping. So the products, materials that you will identify would be some of these critical ones for your organizations where the cost benefit analysis would prove to be, uh, uh, would, would, would uh, then result, uh, the, the, the result of a cost benefit analysis would probably tell you that it is worth doing the mapping. Okay, some other products and commodities, it may not be worth doing. So that's an exercise that you will, you'd want to do before. Uh, building a team of internal stakeholders. So as I said, a lot of information is gathered internally. Uh, so you need to build that team to, to get this information. And then of course, without your the cooperation from your external stakeholders, this is impossible. Like this is impossible. I've never seen somebody sitting on a desk and coming up with a supply chain map, right? You probably need to um, you know, uh, get this team build up, but also building a network or with your external stakeholders. These are all your suppliers, some regulatory authorities, uh, auditors, maybe if you hire external auditors, maybe some consultants on specializing in some particular products and so on and so forth. These could be uh, an external, uh, these are all the external stakeholders that you build a network with. And then finally, of course, once you have the map, once you have the plan, you execute the process to get this information. Okay, so uh, it looks like a very classical, let's say, project management uh, kind of a template, but it is what, what what it is. Eventually, you want to come up with a result which tells you about everything that is involved from the origin to the end market in your product, and that's what uh, you'd you would like to plan and do this uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a good way. Okay, so these are some of the steps uh, that you could follow. Right, so that's that's how you you go about it uh, to understand uh, uh, um, to, or to map, let's say the the result of which will be a very good uh, supply chain map for the product or material that you want to focus on. Okay, right. So that's that's what I wanted to share with you uh, very quickly today. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, I've just put in the agenda to run through what we have seen. Okay, very quickly. So we talked about what is supply chain mapping in the beginning with the example of the phone, the fair phone, where uh, there are plenty of parts that get into this particular product. I want to know where these parts are coming from, who are the suppliers and so on. And so I start mapping them, okay, and to see where in, in, uh, in the entire supply chain. So that's, that's, that's what we call supply chain mapping. Why is it critical? We talked about two things. A lot of companies' uh, focus agenda is risk resilience and security of supply. On one side, at the other side, you have a lot of scrutiny that the companies have, both internal, external, with the conscious consumer, regulatory authorities, and so on. So that gives you a very strong business case of why SCM becomes critical. And then there are plenty of benefits. There are cost savings, innovation, operations, integration of operations, 
and purely uh, risk mitigations, uh, critical raw material tracking, and so on and so forth. So there are plenty of benefits that we have seen. The key elements we talked about, primary and secondary sources of uh, data, all the uh, and, and the basic key elements of all the nodes, which is part of primary and secondary participants, and the links, which is material flow, information flow, and financial flow across these different participants. The sources uh, of information is internal and external, both internal with your ERP systems, interviews, uh, surveys, and so on and so forth. Uh, like for as simple as RFIs, you know, with a simple RFI that you send across to your suppliers, it could also reveal a lot of in information, right? So these are information sources as well as some external information sources where you can buy a lot of information which companies, uh, uh, some of the specialized co companies already work on. Right, and imagine it like the Porter's five forces and its series of analysis of Porter's forces. And we saw a couple of examples. One is of a garment maker, okay, uh, and the other one is for a car maker, right? Uh, uh, one other point that we also saw, which is supply chain mapping comes right at the middle of this entire tiers that we saw with global value maps. Then you have supplier network, map, network maps. Then you have the supply chain maps. And further at the micro level, you have value stream mapping and the, even below that is the process mapping. So you need to understand that uh, there are different levels. And if you want to embark on and extend your supply chain maps, either at the macro level to supply network maps or go one level below at the micro level for value stream and process map. Okay, uh, how do you go about it? This is what we just saw. Uh, identify the right kind of product, uh, identify level one mapping, level two mapping with a clear plan, building a team, building a network, uh, and then go ahead with the execution. Okay, so that's uh, that's what uh, it is all about. Uh, as I said, there are plenty of tools available uh, to do that. One of the examples that we saw with the four, fair for example is a source map. There are some others, let's say, if you're, for example, your fo focus is is uh, risk there, there could be as simple tools as uh, Achilles or Resilink and so on and so forth. If you want to go a bit more on focus on digitalization and so on, then as there are some some generic ones like Blue Yonder, in fact, uh, which is Panasonic now. So there is uh, some general ones as well that can give you a lot of information. But I'm, I'm not here to tell you all the tools. You can you can find that out yourself. But there are plenty of tools that are available who can help you with this. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel uh, a lot. Okay, good. All right, uh, that is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Any questions or queries or comments that you might have? Thank you very much, Jill. Good to see you after quite some time. I hope everything is well with you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll just wait. So you have Alice, Anders, yeah, and uh, Emmanuel, Francois. Hello there. If you have any questions, feel free. Hello, Maite. I can see Maite as well. Good to see you, Marco. Hi there. Luca. Thank you, Terry. Just wait for a couple of minutes. All right, I hope it was clear, by the way. <laughs> I hope it was clear. I just wanted to keep it very simple and clear for those who have not had any initiation to some of the basics of supply chain mapping. So I keep keep it at a very simple level. Uh, if you have any doubts and you want to go beyond and discuss this uh, with me, uh, we'll be very happy to do that. Okay, so you can connect uh, with me at uh, the IPM and then we can take it forward. Thank you, Maite. Thank you for your comment. Okay, uh, right. So if there are uh, no questions, any specific questions on the content itself, I thank you very much for your time. Okay, appreciate it for having spent uh, 45 minutes or maybe a little bit more 
um, for uh, to participate in this uh, in this webinar and thank you for your comments as well all right thank you take care bye bye then